And so I'm just going to start at the beginning. Um, and I'm going to take this moment to remind you again to put away your phones, to move into some place that is quiet in your apartment or dorm room, um, or wait until a later time if things are allowed currently, because you need to focus your entire attention on these videos. Um, this is your lecture portion of the class, and it will help you to prepare for the quizzes that um, I post every week. So do make sure that you're focused and that you're listening, even though I can't see you, that you will act as though I can and, um, you know, be fully present. So here we go. The first question from this week's worksheet was McLuhan pro proclaims technology created the public, um, electric technology created the mass, and that was on page 68. So after reading his explanation of the above axiom, what do you think he means? Use a quotation from the text to support your claim. So if we actually go to the page from the text, which I hope you did do in order to try to answer the question, you'll see um, this quotation is right down here at the bottom of page 68. And right next to it is an illustration um, put, showing us graphically what he had said earlier, that basically uh, the printing had enabled us to think independently and to create our own perspective. And that is what he is saying. Basically, it should make us think of what is the public. Um, we also have to remember that he tells us that environments are not passive wrappings, but are rather active processes which are invisible. So this makes um, us recognizing the fact that individuals have their own perspective, which is visually represented here as something that we see um, optically, that the public didn't exist as an entity before the printing press because people didn't think of the public as really having any meaning. In other words, only the monarchy, only the ruler was really the person who had any worth in a culture before the printing press. Now, McLuhan might be overstating the point, but definitely... If you look back in history, I don't think it's a coincidence that, again, this is something I'm repeating in a new way from last week's videos, that it wasn't until after the printing press that we had um, things like the idea of, of independent nations, such as the United States, such as France, who held revolutions um, in order to declare independence, um, and behind ideals like life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness for the common people. Now, again, we take these ideals for granted today that humans were always seen in this way. But if you look back through history, they were not. So before the printing press, the public didn't see themselves as deserving of attention or even having independent thought from their rulers, from their priests, um, because the Catholic Church really ruled before the printing press came around. Um, and it wasn't until after the printing press came around that various religions broke off, splintered off from the Catholic Church, that various countries split off from their monarchies and tried to overthrow them and say, we are going to be represented by the rights of the democratic populace, the, the public, um, that we are going to be the ones in charge. And so... Print technology created the public. That is what he means by that. It says electric technology created the mass. Now, what the mass is, is, um, is that he says we, sorry, I'm going to scroll up here, that we abandon the luxury of this posture, that the public is the only important entity because this is a fragmentary outlook. In other words, if we're only focused on the um, interests and the ideals and the problems of what's surrounding us, then we're a part of the public. Um, when we become part of the mass, we're looking at other countries, other people outside of our own borders, outside of our own immediate proximity, and we become involved with them. So if you look back to the page before, this image is setting up these ideals that he speaks about on pages 68 and 69. On pages 66 and 67, we have an image here of a um, of a group of people who I'm guessing lived in Africa, and says this new electronic interdependence 
recreates the world in the image of a global village. And so this is what he's saying as is part of the mass is that we're all interconnected, that we get information about people who are very far distant from us um, and that that information then affects the way that we view our daily lives, that we're not just concerned with what's happening in our immediate proximity, but that we change the way we view our immediate proximity based upon people who live in far away um, spaces. That that sort of thought comes back again here in the cartoon that is featured in the page after on page 70, um, where the, the young student is walking through the hallways and saying, it isn't that I don't like current events, there have just been so many of them lately. And that's another point that McLuhan keeps coming back to again and again. You probably noticed this in the recordings um, that you needed to listen to for last week and for this week, this idea that we're being overwhelmed with information. It is sometimes is more important to us or it seems more important to us that an earthquake happened on the other side of the world or a tsunami happened on the other side of the world or an election happened on the other side of the world than you know, the house that burned down in our neighborhood um, or the child who died in our county or in our city. Um, we're more, we get information from everywhere and this mass of information from this mass of people is coming at us constantly, whether it's something that's close to us or something that's far away. And um, a lot of people take uh, umbrage, I guess you could say, with the idea that we're overwhelmed by all of this. The idea of mass culture, um, again, comes up, I think, in a different way in question number two, where I asked you to explore one paradox or irony in McLuhan's observation that, quote, the technology of the railway created the myth of a green pasture world of innocence. It satisfied man's desire to withdraw from society symbolized by the city to a rural setting where he could recover his animal and natural self. It was the pastoral idea, a Jeffersonian world, an agrarian democracy, which was intended to serve as a guide to social policy. It gave us darkest suburbia and his lasting symbol, the lawnmower. And I want to pay attention here again to darkest suburbia and the lawnmower, because I think that these are key terms that he uses. So the images that go along with this, it starts off here with an image of the railway, the railway lines, um, which is continued on the next page. And this is the page on which the um, quotation was taken from. But I think that this is important for us to consider as Americans when we're looking back at the 19th century, which was when the railroad was invented and then um, run out across this, the country, is that we viewed it as a symbol of saying that we could get away from culture, that we could we could start anew, that we could be independent persons, that we could um, conquer the land, et cetera. And the way in which we conquered it was by creating suburban environments, which suburban, if we look at that term closely, is actually a mix between the rural and the urban. Um, and by the ideal of, of what suburbia should look like, which is a nature that has very much been conquered by the lawnmower. Now, the lawnmower, of course, is a symbol, for those of you who have ever lived in a suburban neighborhood, it's a symbol of what your neighbors expect of you, of like this contract that you've, in, you've um, invested in with them, that you are going to keep your lawn neat, that you are going to keep it tamed, that you're going to keep it cultured, that you're not going to let it run wild. And so um, many neighborhoods even have these contracts that you have to sign or to, to move into them saying, I will mow my lawn. Now, when you mow your lawn, of course, it looks very neat and nice and trim. But if you think of it in other ways, it's also like it's, it's very bad for the environment, for the natural rural environment that you supposedly were moving to. Um, because it's bad for the bees and for the butterflies if you cut down their their nectar sources, um, or I'm sorry, their pollen sources. And it's also bad because you're using a lot of gas, um, and which is, you know, fossil fuel. Um, and it's also really a symbol of you, you doing bad things to the environment f in order to appear civilized or cultured to your neighbor. 
And this, I think, is, um, again, one of the central ideas that McLuhan wants to bring us back to is that we need to look past what's called like the grand narrative, you know, suburbia as a place of safety and calm, and also look at the ways in which is not really a safe place for you to retreat to is a place where society and culture is very clearly exerting its influence on you in ways that are detrimental to um, the environment in ways that are also detrimental to the ideal that you're an independent person and very much so reveal that we're participating in these interconnected networks of social pressure where we're going to do things that we know are bad for us um, and are time consuming because we want to make our neighbors happy. Um, and so it's not really an escape as much as a new kind of master. And this is what McLuhan is trying to draw our attention to. So the third question on this week's worksheet, there's a lot of room for you to, um, to move around in here and to create your own personal answer to it, as long as you're thorough um, and clearly explain what you mean that, in, in other words, as long as you cite specific examples and explain to me what you think is significant or important about those examples, um, there's a lot of room for you to do well on this question. I'm going to give you an example of how I view the answer to this question. It's not necessarily a right or a wrong answer. It's just one interpretation of the text. But do always remember that um, a short answer to these worksheets is not necessarily a good one, if, especially if you've been given a lot of room, as you have been given in this question. Um, there's a lot of room for interpretation. And since there's a lot of room for interpretation and I'm not sitting next to you saying, oh, what do you mean by that? You know, you, you've got to make sure that you explain yourself clearly enough that you give specific examples either from the text or from your own life and then explain the significance or importance of those examples to me, what you think is significant or important about them um, so that I can understand what it is you're trying to communicate. So do make sure that you're being clear in your answers. So the actual question is this. One of McLuhan's central critiques that he restates in several different ways is that, quote, the youth of today are not permitted to approach the traditional heritage of mankind through the door of technological awareness, end quote, from page 100. So how do you believe McLuhan's statement manifests itself today? Be specific. So one example of this I think that we can take from the book um, is, this exam is this image um, it spreads out over six pages of the Fairmont Waterworks in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And this is the first image that we see spread across two pages. Um, and then at the bottom page it says Enviro. And then there's two blank pages that say environments are invisible. Their ground rules, pervasive structure, and overall patterns elude easy perception. And again, this is something that McLuhan is asking us to do, is to dig deeper beneath what's easily perceived to think about how technology has created changes to the scale, pace, and patterns of our life that we need to start looking at and questioning. And if you keep scrolling down, we have a complete image of the Fairmont Waterworks in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We, in the citation that says, or the caption that says, we impose the form of the old on the content of the new, the malady lingers on. And, um, so this is one example, I think, of what McLuhan is getting at, where he's saying that the youth are put in this weird, precarious um, position where they're asked to deal with the future, um, but to do so with the strategies and the technologies um, of the past. And so, as you can tell here, this structure that was built in the 19th century, the early 19th century in Pennsylvania, is actually modeled upon Greek architecture. Um, and so this is a visual and architectural representation of this sort of um, impulse that keeps going on again and again in human culture. Now I'm running out of time on this 15 minute video, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause and then continue this discussion in the next, in 